Welcome to our live webcast, Fishing for Answers, a webinar on cybersecurity startups. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mike, and I'll be the operator for the presentation today. We are joined today by our moderator, Mark Singer, Managing Partner at Osage University Partners, and our panelists, John Lee, Principal at Osage University Partners, Jake Flomenberg, Partner at Excel Partners, and Amir Ben-Afrim, Co-Founder and CEO of Menlo Securities. So at this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Mark Singer, to begin with opening comments. Hello, everybody. This is Mark Singer, and I'm a managing partner here at Osage University Partners, and I'm in charge of our tech investment practice. Um, today, we're having a conversation on cybersecurity startups, and we're particularly pleased to have Jake and Amir join us. Jake is from Excel Partners, and if anyone on the phone doesn't know Excel, they are you know, a top-tier venture capital firm with a very strong um, practice in investing in security companies. And Amir is CEO and founder of Menlo Security, which has happens to be a university spin-out uh, in the security space, and Osage University Partners is an investor in Menlo. We selected cybersecurity as a topic because over the last few years here at Osage, we've seen a significant uptick in the number of high-quality university spin-outs in the security space, which mirrors the uptick in activity we've seen in the security market overall. As many of you on the phone know, OUP tracks all of the spin-out activity from our partner universities, and our own internal data shows that 2016 was a record year for new university spin-outs in the security space. Our goal today today is to provide guidance regarding how to think about the security market overall, and specifically how to approach creating a university spin-out in this space. Um, as as uh, the moderator mentioned at the beginning, this webinar will be structured as a panel with Q&A. We will have a few slides presented that will contain some data points relevant to our discussion. If you happen to have submitted questions prior to the webinar, we really appreciate it, and our panelists will be discussing those questions. If you have not yet submitted any questions, and would like to do so at any time during the webinar, you can send in a question using the, the text chat located on the right, hand, right side hand of your screen. Sometimes you may find we'll rephrase your question slightly, um, so you may hear the substance of your question with slightly different wording. So I'm now going to turn it over to our speakers for brief introductions. After that, we'll spend some time focused specifically on what it means to be a university spin-out in cybersecurity, and then we'll broaden the discussion out to talk about trends overall in the security space. So John Lee, I'm going to start with you. Do you would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Hi, uh, this is John Lee. I'm a principal at uh, Osage Partners. I work uh, largely with Mark on uh, various infrastructure and enterprise software investment opportunities. Over the last few years, we've, we've been looking at quite a few opportunities in cybersecurity, and I'm excited to discuss some of these with, with, with two leading experts in the area. So thanks a lot for, for joining and, and, and look forward to the webinar. Great, thanks. So Jake, it'd be great if you could uh, take a minute to introduce yourself and also talk a little bit about your focus at Excel. Sure. Um, so my name is Jake Flomenberg. I'm a partner at Excel. I've been here for about five years. I come from Splunk and Cloudera, so a lot of my initial focus in investment uh, started on the data side of the house, and I spend time on data, security, cloud, SaaS, basically all things enterprise. Um, and and Excel, you know, just really briefly, um, you know, really invest in all stages. So from hundred thousand dollar seed stage check to hundred million dollar growth equity check anywhere on the planet, um, uh, but really focus on seed and Series A and, and technology-driven businesses. Great. Thanks, Jake. So, Amir, it would be great to have you talk about your background, and then afterwards, I'm going to ask you to tell the story of Menlo and how <laughs> university technology fit into the early development of the company. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, I've been in cybersecurity for about 20 years. I actually started my career there at a company called Checkpoint Software, which uh, is still around and prominent company and so on. Uh, I joined them in 98. Eventually led uh, business and corporate development for Checkpoint. Uh, left them to do a startup of my own, um, <clears throat> where interestingly, Excel was one of the investors. Uh, so it's kind of a small world here. Uh, that company, uh, name is Altor Networks, was acquired by Juniper Networks, where I ended up leading um, cloud security efforts for Juniper. Um, and then finally departed Juniper and started this latest venture here at Menlo. Uh, do you want to kind of jump right into 
chatting a little bit about Menlo, Mark? Yeah, it would be, it'd be great to have you rewind the clock to the beginning of Menlo, again, with a, with a particular orientation to uh, the Berkeley technology that went into Menlo and how all of that came to, to become part of the company. Sure. So the, the founding team, is, as you can tell, myself included, came from industry. Uh, we actually spent decades in, in the industry uh, with the various leading vendors, such as the names I've mentioned. And as we were surveying the landscape, we recognized growing gaps uh, in cyber defense, as, as you can all, uh, I'm sure, appreciate um, reading the headlines every day. Uh, and we wanted to form some guiding principles about how we're going to innovate and actually try to hopefully take a big bite out of this problem. Uh, specifically, we wanted to leverage the cloud as a layer of isolation against malware threats from web and email, and that was kind of a big guiding principle for us for what we wanted to do. Um, and so as, as we're basically crunching and kind of moving forward on this idea, I got introduced to Professor Don Song from UC Berkeley. Uh, she had formed a small startup with some grad students and postdocs, and they were pursuing a very similar track. Uh, by the time we met, uh, her effort was being driven by uh, a Dr. Gautam Altakar as the chief architect and sort of principal engineer, also kind of writing all the code for this. Uh, we recognized that they had some very unique nuggets to what they were doing um, and, and a great approach that we fell in love with. So we basically said, hey, here's some great innovation. Um, rather than sort of try to rebuild the wheel, why don't we find a way to partner? And we ended up offering to acquire the effort and spin it into Menlo Security. And actually, Gotham ended up joining us as our own Menlo's chief architect. So it was kind of great collaboration from the very beginning. Um, this all happened in 2013. In the three and a half years since, we've raised over $45 million to commercialize the technology and obviously polish it and uh, you know enhance it and so forth. We ended up shipping our first product in early 2015, uh, grew the team to about 100 people, and we're fortunate to have over 100 customers with publicly referenceable names such as JP Morgan, Fujitsu, Macy's, and so on, to name a few. So I, I would say it's been a, a very successful collaboration. I'm very pleased with how things have worked out thus far. Uh, we obviously, you know, uh, continue to hold a, a close relationship with Professor Dong Song. She remains an advisor to the company. Um, and I, I would call it sort of a great success um, of collaboration between, say, folks from industry and uh, the academia. Thanks, Amir. That was really helpful. And, there, you know, there are a couple of interesting themes there about the Menlo story that we'll come back to in a little bit, in particular the notion that Menlo started with a market need and a problem you wanted to address and then found university technology to address it, which is often kind of the opposite order that university startups go, where they start with a discovery and an interesting innovation and then go out to the market and figure out how to apply it. And we'll come back and talk about those challenges, particular um, in security, in, in a little bit. Uh, before we get to that, though, Jake, it would be great to have you talk about um, some of Excel's activities, in particular with universities, and you know how, how and, and as specific as you can get, in particular around uh, security spinouts you've seen from universities. How engaged are you with that? What observations do you have about both um, security technologies you're seeing at universities, and then also perhaps you could even broaden that out to software technologies at large from universities. Universities. Yeah, so I'll do my best, and unfortunately, we can't talk publicly about all of our um, security investments with universities um, at the moment. Um, but um, you know, we, we've done a lot of work uh, in and around enterprise software um, with entrepreneurs that are coming out of academia for for many years, sort of dating all the way back to uh, Riverbed, if if not beyond. Um, the company that's not quite in the security space that I've spent the most time with over the last couple of years um, is a company called Trifacta that was led by um, Professor Joe Hellerstein uh, from Berkeley and, and, and Jeff here from Stanford and actually one of their co-advised uh, grad students that's in the ETL and, and data prep space. Um, but one of the things I'd say is that as we get to know a lot of the primary researchers doing things in and around security, um, you know, all of them have built fundamentally interesting technology. And I think, you know, for, from from my perspective, I think it's very unlikely that anyone's efforts coming out of academia 
academia are going to fail for technological reasons. And so while there's usually this sort of um, what I'd call two-step process for a normal company formation, um, I think of it really in three buckets um, for, uh, for companies coming out of universities, and, and I think especially so for uh, security companies. So there's some sort of core technology insight or asset, um, and then there's this question of how to actually apply it. What is, what is, it it's going to work and it'll work for, you know, probably in the most sophisticated environments with the most sophisticated smart end users. But there's this notion of a real world app. Um, you know, like what edge cases does this does this not account for? And can this can this work where, you know, the, the security team, for instance, on the other side is is not a team of experts, but you know, is is the twenty two year old we hired last week. Um, and that is where um, you know we spend the vast majority of our time on the diligence, understanding what the potential for real-world viability is. I don't think we spend a whole lot of time at the outset thinking about go-to-market and all those things. Um, those things happen over time, but that transition from sort of not even technology in search of a problem, but like core technical prototype to real-world applicability um, is, is the area where we've seen, um, quite frankly, the most opportunity, but also uh, the, the most companies uh, fall down. And so the advice I always like to, to give to technical entrepreneurs is that if they walk in our office, you know, particularly with a good credential from academia, saying that they have a solution to this problem, um, we're going to believe them no matter where they are in that journey, more often than not. And so if they have an hour in their day, what they should be doing is helping validate the, the, this initial stages of real-world real world viability. That will de-risk the project far more than another hour spent in the code or, you know, unlocking the next level of, uh, uh, of technology. And sometimes that's uncomfortable for them and sometimes they need help, uh, but that's what moves the needle the, 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 the furthest, the quickest. If that makes okay. sense. And then, yeah, and keep going with that because, you know, with, with, with our own investments here, that's a, a continuous struggle given that everything we look at are um, technologies coming out of universities. So how would you then guide a company to go validate that real world viability? What, what kind of steps would you like to see them take? And how, how, how do you know in a certain circumstance if you, if you feel comfortable that they have established that? Yeah, I mean, and so, I mean, I mean, the first is it, it, it sort of even starts with, you know, what is the measure of success? And sometimes people will compare their product to open source benchmarks. They'll, they'll tout adoption by the most sophisticated of security buyers. Um, but the, but the real world when the rubber meets the road is like most people by definition are, you know, not in the top 1% of security sophistication. And so validate in in the mid market, right? To understand what the what the path to adoption is, um, is 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 where I think it's probably actually easiest because these companies can move a lot faster than you know the largest banks uh, of of the world, um, and and they can give you that feedback of what they need to consume. The perspective that we all that we almost always find missing is what does that mere mortal um, need to be successful with your technology? Yes. If you show up on site, you can help them. Um, but without you, um, you know, how do these guys get going? And that's the gap that we're very frequently looking to overcome. And we're not looking for it to be explicitly uh, like over, overcome. We're looking for the, the potential, right? We're, we're looking to understand how wide is that chasm um, and can we be helpful? And, and quite frankly, do you have a, a sound awareness uh, uh, of that chasm? Okay, that, that's helpful. And part, part of what I was um, trying to understand from your perspective is, you know, we have um, on the phone lots of uh, licensing officers from universities and some academics. One of the questions I think they all have is, what, is, what do those data points need to look like? like uh, so is it uh, to show that there's validation? Is it that they need to have had 20 customer conversations? Is it that they need an actual kind of joint development yeah. agreement? Do they need no, to be I, a free group of contracts? Look, I, I, think, I think contracts and, and money and, and all those things are great, but um, I think the earliest proxy is, is people vote with their time. Um, and so... 
you know, you can call it a, like a, not even a customer reference, but like a, a viability check, right? To say, hey, I've lined up four people on the other side um, that have given me the, this sort of, you know, we'll call it a verbal M- MOU, right? To say like, if you build this, I will, I will deploy it. I will be a design partner for you, right? Those are, those are the sort of uh, pieces of feedback that, that excite us the most. Um, and also know like uh, we're, we're looking for people that can be a valuable end customer. There's lots of um, there's lots of security technology that people aspire to commercialize through OEM and other forms of, of go to market and I think that's a, uh, maybe that's a that, that's a separate question but what, what we're really looking for is can you directly bring this to market not can you you know suck this data feed in and, and make your own product better. Um, and so something to watch out for is I think it's great to spend time with other security companies, but, but know that we'll view that a little bit differently um, than a normal enterprise customer adopting your technology or, or agreeing to try it. Okay, that's helpful. And, and Amir, it probably would be great to talk about how you went about this exact process. So how did you go about validating Memo Security's product in the market, finding the right niches for it, and, and figuring out kind of where, what, where, what direction to go from a product standpoint as well as a commercial standpoint? Yeah, I, I think maybe the, the key to all efforts like this is being very focused. I mean, what, what problem are you trying to solve? And why does this problem matter, right? So I think it starts with answering those two questions um, and forming some forming your own thesis on on where you think you add value. Uh, if the problem matters and you can really solve it, then uh, then then you're onto something. Um, so once you've sort of formed that in your head, or the sort of founding team has agreed on, hey, we think we can solve this problem, uh, and, and here's the pain associated with it, the only way to validate that is to go outside the office and speak with customers. So I think you'll find some sort of repeating theme probably throughout the day and questions is you, you got to kind of market test it. So you got to go out and have conversations. Uh, if the problem matters, and uh, as Jake said, people vote with their time, they'll speak with you uh, and they'll sort of hear you out and they'll sort of validate that, yeah, this is a real issue in my life. And uh, if you could solve it, then I'm quite interested. Um, if they're not willing to speak with you or not giving you the time of day, or if they speak with you and they say, you know what, this is not a big, big priority for me, perhaps the problem is not as prominent as you thought it was. So I think that's the key, is just sort of getting outside the office and having as many conversations with different types of customers too, big, small, medium, right? And that, that'll help you uh, assess where the opportunity is, is ripest for you. And, and one of the things that I would add on to that that I noticed, Amir, in watching you and Memo Security from the early days is it, it seemed like it was one thing to go out and talk to a bunch of customers who seemed interested in your isolation platform. But, it, then, I, but, but then those conversations ultimately drew, got very specific towards a very specific use case. You know, your technology could apply to a lot of lots of different areas, and that's true in security at large. So lately, we've seen tons of encryption technologies from universities that can apply to given areas, and then an entrepreneur may say they want to focus on one industry, but even that's not specific enough. And ultimately, it takes very specific kind of call called unique use cases that are applications of the technology to ultimately start getting customer adoption. And would you is that consistent with kind of your sense of the early days of yeah, I mean, for, for us, honestly, it's just kind of follow the pain, right? So you speak with somebody and they say, hey, this is great, um, you know, but, but here's the problem I'm actually having, right? Uh, you know, in our case, you know, we, we had some corporations kind of blocking big parts of the Internet because they were too risky and it was causing business disruption for them. Um, so they looked for an isolation platform to essentially, you know, give a better user experience to um, to the complaining end users, those who are being blocked that they cannot get out and, and view sort of large parts of the web. Uh, and that was a, a sharp pain for them. So we started off with sort of risky websites, if you will. And, you know, it wasn't sort of very obvious for us when we formed a company that that would be the starting point. 
and, and then you sort of, if it works for one customer and you get that working well, then you sort of start talking about, about the same problem with other customers and you build resonance. So for sure, I think it's those customer conversations lead to uh, those points where the pain is sharpest or the, the sort of articulation of value is, is, is clearest. And, uh, and then it's kind of following that path. Great. Well, um, to keep pushing forward, first as a reminder for the audience, at any time if anybody has a question, please feel free to, uh, to type it in. We have some questions we're working through, but feel free to um, provide any others. Um, I'm going to turn it to John for a second and have him talk about um, some of the startup activity we've seen in the security space from our partner universities. Yeah, one of the things that I've noticed that isn't quite obvious to a lot of um, people in licensing or even, even professors at universities is the rich history that universities have played um, in cybersecurity. There are actually a number of quite notable uh, cybersecurity companies today that, that have university roots. For example, RSA and Symantec were, were both uh, spin outs out of research labs. Uh, Junior Francisco, while they uh, were not initially started as uh, solely focused on cybersecurity companies. Both came from uh, research work at Xerox Park and at Stanford. And so, you know, this, this space has had a lot of contributions from the university ecosystem and from PIs and researchers in the past. And, uh, you know, I just thought it was important to note that. As far as uh, the, the, the landscape today, we're, we're seeing a lot of pretty interesting stuff come out of universities. I would say that in, in recent years, we've seen a, a lot of next generation encryption uh, companies, companies like Dyadic, they're, they're using things called secure multi-party computation or a secret sharing. Uh, to create uh, new ways of authentication or key management. Um, we've seen uh, a number of uh, companies doing uh, things in network security using techniques like formal verification. Um, we've seen quite a lot of companies which, which may be a little, a little bit hyped, uh, but it's essentially machine learning for X um, cybersecurity solution. And we've seen quite a lot of that. A lot of researchers that have spent a lot of time machine learning will just basically apply uh, what they have to, to libraries and, and, and create better detection tools or, or other types of solutions. Um, and then some of the uh, kind of more interesting areas that we're seeing today pop up are, are areas that are automating detecting and, and, and responses. Recently, there was an event called the Cyber Grand Challenge, which, which teamed a lot of uh, large and good university teams against each other to create completely automated defenses and um, offensive uh, cyber, cyber reasoning systems, um, which is quite interesting. Um, you know, the, 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 the slide here shows kind of more recent university spin-outs. There are a number of exits. All these exits weren't uh, really positive outcomes, but a number of them were actually pretty decent. Um, and there's still quite a lot of companies. Um, this is only a sample of them, but they're working on some really interesting interesting next generation solutions. Thanks. And to build on that, you know, here at Osage, you know, we're, I think we're tracking about 100 interesting kind of recent security companies that have spun out from our university partners. And as we mentioned at the start, that's been a marked increase. So, you know, we're hopeful to see the amount of investment that goes into university spin outs in this space increase over the next several years. Um, I want to now talk about another of the challenges that uh, cybersecurity spin-outs have and all spin-outs have from universities is the challenge around management and whether you need an outside entrepreneur, when do you get it, can a PI run their own company or not, and yeah, Jake, it'd be great to have you comment on your perspective on what you want to see from a management team with a university spin-out and what, what are the different configurations that, that are attractive to you? Sure. Um, you, you know, I'll, I'll use uh, some language uh, that actually comes from the academic research on entrepreneurship. Um, there's this sort of, uh, it's called the, the rich versus king dilemma or the, the rich versus king choice, right? Um, and there's this notion you can be the king of nothing or, you know, you, you may not be king um, and you may get rich. Um, and, and that really at the first pass is, is the acid test that, that we look for. And it's really one of awareness. Um, We've worked with entrepreneurs.
entrepreneurs that have have been founder and CEO and taking companies public. Um, and we've worked with some that have, you know, decided that they weren't the right ones to hold the reins all the way from the outset and, and everything in between. Um, the, the, the things that we think about uh, most importantly are this notion of awareness. Like, do you have a sense of what your critical skill set is? You may have desire to develop that skill set um, over time, um, but, but, just a, but just a willingness to put the success of the company before your own you know, personal, uh, wh- whatever it may be, ego or, or, or otherwise. And um, th- that's really the test that we, that we have at the early stage, more so than explicitly what you want to do. And for, for uh, folks from academia that do have that awareness, um, you know, we're very willing uh, to partner. Um, there is this inevitable question of timing, I would say, for the most part, and the data would show um, that, in general, the founder of an enterprise uh, security company, um, that, that is, is unless they, they, they've sort of been on a uh, publicly traded at executive board before, are, are highly unlikely to be the, the CEO at the time a company goes public uh, 10 years later. So, so there's this notion of timing. When is when is the right time um, to get to get more help? And whether that's a, a, a peer or, or a CEO, it, it, it depends on the situation. Um, you know, and what I'd say is there, there's a balance to strike between really, quite frankly, the attractiveness of of the person that you can recruit on the other side. Something that has you know no commercial customers may not be as appealing for for someone um, to to come and help you run as something later stage. That person that has all this later stage experience might not be the right person um, to, to help you get things off the ground. Um, I would almost say you should be so lucky to find someone that you're willing to give up that much equity for to help you along your way. Um, there's a lot of professors that say, hey, I, I would love to be CEO. I think I'm going to have to be involved in the initial sales process. And then one year in, I would like to hand over the reins. Um, and, and maybe that means I will go back to be the CTO. Maybe that means like I'll go back to academia and it will be a quarter time or half time um, in, in all other sorts of configurations. And it's more about just an awareness and a mutual uh, agreement on how to have these discussions over time. It could be, you know, as in sort of the case, uh, Amir's case, which you can talk about where, you know, you, Dawn was very involved in an in inception and, and decided that she didn't want to be, you know, day to day hands on going forward. Um, and, and that's fine too. Um, so all of these work trouble, trouble, Trouble is where you, you, you can't have an open and honest, honest dialogue about what's going on. Great. And that's very consistent with what we see here, where um, there are some academics who uh, really want to be CEO and believe they can and in some sense are unwilling to engage in the dialogue around that, and that makes it more difficult. There are others who are simply don't want to do it and just want to be a part of it, and then you have to figure out how to find the right team. And, you know, the ones in the middle, uh, like, again, what we want is to have that same transparent, open dialogue about how do you know if somebody's going to be good or not, and, and how do you balance an academic with other people around the table. You know, I would say from our standpoint, most of the time, uh, we are the businesses we are funding, there is not an academic as um, a CEO, um, but usually they are deeply affiliated with the company, as um, happened with Menlo. <laughs> Mark, um, I'd like to add just a little comment here, um, and, and this is more just to, for entrepreneurs coming out of academia doing this for the first time. Uh, I strongly uh, suggest for people to get advice. It, it, there are infinite pitfalls you can avoid by simply finding experienced folks who've done this before. It can save you from making common mistakes uh, that are going to be very costly down the road. And it can also help you think about how to properly set up and structure your business and and think about sort of getting outside help and all that type of stuff. So, again, just like anything, uh, people have done this before and kind of surrounding yourself with folks who were willing to kind of give you that advice is super helpful. I I know it's been helpful for me. It's my my third startup and I still have sort of a go-to group of people where – you know, I, I get their advice uh, quite frequently, actually, as, as the business grows, as things change. It's, it's nice to have that outside perspective. That's a great point. And to build on that, Amir, how would you, if, if you were to guide uh, an academic, how would you guide them to go find that advice? 
who do they, how do they find, how do they look for those people? What types of people are the right people to provide advice and how should they go about that process? A lot of it's personal network, right? So, you know, typically in, in universities, right, there's a lot of successful people and, and from there, you know, whether it be families or friends or extended, you know, friends and family, there's usually probably someone there who's done something similar or has walked down uh, a particular journey that, that perhaps looks similar. Um, perhaps the university itself, if it has licensing officers that have worked with other companies that have commercialized, they can make introductions into people who've gone through some of these similar processes. So, you know, it's kind of being uh, creative, I suppose, in terms of your own network and what the university may offer and, you know, seeking guidance. Uh, I, I've found that people are pretty open, right? If, if sort of someone reaches out and says, look, I'm not looking for you to give me money or any of this kind of stuff. I'm, we're both sort of fellow alums from the same university. I'm onto something interesting. I'm, I'd like your advice because you've done this before. People are pretty willing to assist has been my, my discovery. And I would say our own experience being on kind of the receiving end of companies who have gone and found that advice is specific to the security space. Sometimes um, entrepreneurs or academics will go out and get advice from um, others who have been in the IT world at large but don't have deep domain experience in security. And, and our, our own perspective here is that security is a, a world that requires deep domain expertise. So as you're seeking that advice, keep a strong filter of finding people who know the security world well, because um, because it's, it's, it's a challenging world with lots of companies, lots of competitors, interesting selling dynamics. And so, you know, specific security experience is invaluable as you find mentors and other people who will help guide the company. So maybe, maybe we should now go and just talk about the security industry at large and some of the trends that we're seeing overall there. So I'd like to turn it back over to John to just talk about some of the kind of broader trends we're seeing in the security market at large, and then we'll come back to some of the specific questions uh, some of you have had around the market. Yeah, so this is um, the, the, the graph uh, currently on the slide is, is um, um, the amount of fundraising raised by dollar and by deal count for venture rounds in cybersecurity companies. And it's pretty obvious to see that there's been a pretty strong uh, general increase over the last uh, 10 years. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that it, it, it really did peak in, in, in 2015, but um, there, there are certain types of deals that at least uh, we've seen um, had, had uh, quite a lot of interest in 2015, maybe less in 2016, which was large late stage financings for cybersecurity companies. Um, you know, we think those have decreased a little bit and some of the data has indicated that, um, and, but we, we still feel like there's a pretty strong environment around early stage financings for cybersecurity companies. So as far as impact uh, for the licensing officers on the call, I, I would say that there's still a pretty healthy environment for early stage financings in, in cybersecurity. And if anything, at least uh, qualitatively or anecdotally, we've seen a marked increase in early stage financings for cybersecurity companies in the last year um, here at OSH. We actually saw probably a bigger decrease in 2015 um, and an increase in 2016. Um, the next slide that we have is just a general breakdown of uh, cybersecurity uh, by uh, the, the the security type or or, or the, the the vector that they're that the a solution is protecting. Um, so you know, I'll just go through. You know, this is a bit of an eye chart. There are obviously a lot of uh, there's a lot of diversity in cybersecurity, and sometimes it's a little tough uh, creating great nomenclature around it. Um, but uh, the, I, I think the notice, noticeable areas of increase between the last couple years, um, I, I'd be happy to point it out. I would say that at least for uh, specialized threat analysis and protection uh, solutions, which is over on the left, we've seen a pretty large increase of, of opportunities in that space, almost double in, in, in the last year or so. Um, other areas that, that have increased quite a lot in, in interest for, for cybersecurity companies are industrial and IoT cybersecurity companies, um, 
data security companies, and, and recently we've, we've been seeing a lot of regulatory and compliance-focused companies, um, either insurance-based or, or companies focusing on employee misbehavior or, or insider threat. Um, these have been pretty interesting. Um, are areas that we've seen some decline in investing in, in, in startups are areas in specialized st threat protection. I would say that over the the last few years, previous to the last two years, there was, there was really a flood of a lot of advanced threat protection companies out in the market, and we've seen a decline of this uh, opportunities recently. We've also seen a lot of uh, decline in endpoint security uh, solutions, and then also fraud prevention. Um, and so, um, and the next slide, you know, it, it's just kind of another way to to, to cut the previous graph. It, it, it's just indicating different areas and and and, and how to identify it. Um, I would say that. You know, this is not necessarily important um, in, in terms of kind of knowing uh, exactly what your sector is, but I would say that generally there, there are some trends that, that are important to follow in this space. Great. Thanks, John. So, so Jake and Amir, what, what are the two of you seeing in the market? And in particular, what are you seeing as kind of uh, the biggest areas of growth right now? So a lot of the, um, a number of the attendees on the call asked us various questions around kind of what are the pain points in the market? You know, if, if someone was to start a security company today, where should they start it? So where, where do you see the biggest opportunities here? Um, yeah, this is Jake. I'm happy to go first. Um, uh, I mean, so like the, the first macro comment I would make is, uh, and I think security entrepreneurs should remember, market is open. Um, I mean, we're in a category where for uh, innovation, there are very few people that are, that are going to say, hey, I'm going to turn to this publicly traded in incumbent um, for for the next solution, or I'm a I'm an X shop and they provide me you know a full suite and I'm happy with it. Um, that's not a method we really have heard in the past five years. Um, one of the things that that we observe is that there's obviously been a lot of new security tools, and the pitch for here's a new solution X for threat vector Y um, is getting increasingly hard. I have the two, so it would be like I. 87 security tools right now, and, and you want to sell me an 88th, um, you know, I want fewer tools. Um, so, so one of the things that we're most excited about is, is, is being able to, to go back to that CISO and say, hey, um, you, you already have 87 tools. How would you like to get more value out of your existing resources? whether those are, um, you know, human resources or, or software resources. Um, and so this category of security validation and orchestration is, a, is an area that we've seen uh, a lot of attention to uh, paid over the last year, and that includes things like, you know, vulnerable uh, management uh, uh, on the beginning of the validation side, these periodic checks, the notion that, hey, why, why would I get a pen test uh, every, every once a year versus, you know, every hour automatically to a certain extent, all the way to the orchestration uh, side. How do, I, how do I help arm human beings to, to be more effective uh, and automate the parts of the job that, that don't require that high intellect, that don't require that human in the loop? Hackers are starting to automate uh, as much as they can, and they only need to get through once. Um, so that area, we've seen a tremendous amount of investment over the past year. Um, other cloud security, uh, cloud security is in the early days. Uh, even from a basic access management perspective, I'd tell you that anecdotally, I've walked and looked at the admin credentials for uh, usually AWS for many, many unicorn companies in the Bay Area, and the number of people who have a single credential where someone could delete the sum total of the production application and all the backups is, is, is unfortunately quite shocking. Um, and so some of the security solutions that we need to fix these problems are honestly not, not that complicated, and, and just a little bit would move uh, the world quite forward. Um, uh, data encryption and protection remains an area of interest. I think it's one of the, the areas um, that a lot of large enterprises will tell you that they get the highest sort of ROI on. Um, the notion of app-centric security, whether that is, you know, maybe the future of, of these things like WAF and, and where exactly uh, are things going to sit out at the perimeter or going to be much more contextual uh, to the application to make more dynamic reasoning decisions versus static rules. Um, you know, and then further out, I think 
things like container security, uh, we're starting to see a little bit more adoption of um, right now, maybe CISOs who want to check a box, but have plans to do more interesting things over time. Dick, I think we might have just lost you. Um, so if you can hear us, you seem to have been cut off. Um, Amir, uh, hopefully you're still there. And you know, what, where, what would you say are some interesting opportunities that you're seeing in the market? I'm still here. Um, so I'd say kind of what's what's hot right now, where I see kind of a, a fair bit of buzz and, and perhaps sort of large deals happening and so forth. Um, there's a fair bit going on with the kind of next generation endpoint security. Um, you know, antivirus just as a, as a concept, which is really the primary endpoint security agent, if you will, has kind of outlived its usefulness. Um, so people are definitely looking at some sort of combinations of machine learning and, you know, sort of file and kernel analysis that go beyond the traditional virus type stuff. Um, both the incumbents are starting to innovate there a little bit, uh, as well as some new companies uh, that have risen and gotten a lot of attention for themselves and, and kind of have grown pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, definitely a, a hot market. The, the cloud access control type stuff, sort of who's allowed to go where, uh, who's allowed to use Salesforce, what files are they allowed to upload to Salesforce, and so on, um, you know, is, is a space that's getting, you know, a lot of adoption. Uh, as Jake mentioned, a bit of this sort of automated orchestration. There's so many events in security, so much incident response that people uh, need help. Uh, so some tools rising to sort of help automate, you know, those workflows. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a rise in our sector of isolation as people sort of look to new ideas of preventing the problem in the first place, uh, isolation being one of those kind of, you know, strong ideas in terms of how to do that better is certainly rising. Uh, I would advise entrepreneurs, though, in terms of, you know, you want to focus on what's going to rise tomorrow, not what's hot today. If it's hot today, you've probably missed it, right? To sort of show up, you know, if you start your R&D today, by the time you build anything, that some, something that's going to be of commercial quality, you're going to be two years, three years behind the industry leaders, sometimes longer. Um, so you want to think about tomorrow's problems, not so much today. Uh, on, on tomorrow problem kind of thing, I, I'm personally quite scared about the whole, you know, IoT, industrial automation, automotive, you know, problems is everything goes digital and everything gets connected to the network. And you can imagine the nightmares we're having just protecting our own PCs and iPhones and, you know, mobile devices. If we sort of replicate all those troubles onto kind of the industrial world or our cars or, you know, all of those kinds of things, um, it can be quite a nightmare. So I, I really hope that we start as an industry to focus on this world and, and build kind of a more hardened approach uh, and do it better than the way we did sort of the traditional kind of, you know, uh, PC-based internet that we have today. Thank you, and, and uh, we, you know, we got a, a question from a participant related to that exact point around security for IoT devices. In, in this case, it was, it was a question around security for medical devices, around wearables or implantables, and, and there obviously you have big security issues, also regulatory issues, so it's a complicated area. Have either of you kind of seen much in that world, and do you have any perspective on, on kind of either the problem or what you're seeing in the market to try to solve it? I can go first and see if Jake's back on or not. Um, I'm back on, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, just generally speaking, there haven't been as many successes in that world. So probably sort of the most of the money uh, in, in terms of outcomes has been on the enterprise side. So therefore, most of the investment money has gone to the enterprise side. Um, and if you think of sort of a wearable device, it's sort of a little bit, uh, and then the problem is real. Anything with an IP address can be hacked, right? Uh, and I think there's been some black hat, you know, events that demonstrated hacking a pacemaker or something like that. But um, again, if you sort of think of the commercial opportunity, well, uh, you know, who is going to pay for it and, you know, how is that going to come about and what motivation do people have to go do that? I think it's, it gets a lot of attention because it's kind of a, an exotic problem that has some pretty grave consequences, um, but it's not, 
you know, perhaps is sort of commercially viable. So I think that's the key is like, uh, you know, I mean, what, what about kind of all the IP connected devices in hospitals? Think of MRI machines, right? They all run probably a Windows console somewhere in the back and then it gets connected because, you know, your MRI goes out over the network and gets stored somewhere. Uh, and that Windows console probably hasn't been updated in 10 years. And if any of you are in the security industry, you know it's sort of an unpatched version of Windows that's 10 years old. The security level of that's not very high, right? So, um, so I think there's tremendous opportunities here. Uh, but then it's kind of you know waking people up to the priority, and, and I'm you know absolutely certain that the hacks are coming. They've always come before, and they always will. Um, so, so I, I'd add a couple of things. Uh, first, I'd say that um, I think it's very true of perhaps like the, the industrial manufacturing industry and it may be partially true of the medical and healthcare industry. Um, first of all, a lot, a lot of these technologies, to, to, to Amir's point, are, are, are actually much, much older. In addition to old, unpatched machines, you have these sort of esoteric protocols. And quite frankly, you have systems where um, uh, some of the basic things that we might try to do don't work. Sometimes interrogating the network, um, you know, could actually break your devices, uh, almost sadly, um, because of, uh, of the way that we've been built, that they've been built. And so the way I describe the situation in a lot of these circumstances is the amount of technology that will move the world forward and the level of security uh, in some of these IoT uh, areas is, is actually quite low because we have essentially nothing today. So, but by definition, almost anything is better. And, and there's some, been some very interesting, even just most, most, from the most basic perspective, whitelist models of, you know, let's at least clamp down on who is allowed on the way in um, and, and out, if nothing else. Um, and so the way I would frame it for this audience is that the basis of success, the basis of competition is less about a technology insight, although it's important, uh, it's about go to market. And as Amir alluded to, the Go to market in some of these sectors is very, very complicated. Um, I just spent uh, some time earlier this week with folks doing secure over the air update for motor vehicles, um, bi directional, and I think that's going to actually be quite important. Uh, who do you who do you sell that to? Do you sell that to the the fleets? Do you sell it to the OEMs? Are they too arrogant to buy anything from you? Do you sell it to the tier ones? Do you sell it from the tier twos? It's not even you know necessarily obvious in some of these very complicated. Uh, um, supply chain to your end customer is. Um, and so I think the, the path, identifying correctly the path to market and proving that it's not going to take, uh, in some cases, particularly for, for devices, you know, five-year cycle times to get baked into standards is a higher and more difficult bar than enterprise go-to-market. And we're very excited about, um, you know, ooh, partnering with companies that have solutions here. But I think that bar to have a business partner and a well-understood go-to-market earlier um, is higher in these categories. And, and without that, um, it, it, it almost doesn't matter what you build. Right, and, then, and then to jump to, to the other side of what, what are um, areas of security that are just way overplayed, over-competitive, what would you stay away from? So as, um, you know, get a lot of the licensing officers here have to figure out what IP to push forward and where to invest time. So what are, what are areas that you would guide them to stay away from? Jake, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I'll say, um, you know, at, at, at this point, um, uh, a couple of comments. Um, I think endpoint, you know, is always going to be an opportunity that keeps on giving. If you look at the endpoint market, the number of companies that are now, you know, recently over the past couple of years worth over a billion dollars, um, you know, it's, 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 it's probably about five by my count, if not more, uh, of, of just the recent ilk. And so there's a lot of companies that have very, very large war chests. Um, and so if you don't have a strategy to, to deal with them, I think sort of net new uh, malware protection on endpoint uh, can be tricky just from a, a market stance perspective with all these, you know, large, fast-moving uh, companies. Um, we talked about some of the advanced security analytics. Um, I think there's some markets that started off, I, I call like user behavior analytics, a market that, you know, we studied uh, for, for a long time and sort of came to the conclusion that this is an interesting feature 
uh, but perhaps not a, a product category um, and belongs inside or as part of some other solutions. And we've seen companies that started marketing themselves as, as user behavior analytics, but now today market themselves as SIM. And, and I think that's maybe not the right categorization or nomenclature, but I think that's indicative of um, you know, some trends we're seeing in that market. I would say for, for this particular audience, um, getting for these advanced security analytics on big data, getting the understanding the basis of competition is important because a lot of these analytics products tout um, my anomaly detection is, is better than yours. I can I can find this other thing that, that, that no one else can. And while that's great, and while, again, the top 1% of security uh, to companies from a sophistication perspective will put a very smart human being uh, uh, on that to spend four hours to address it, everyone else wants to know what a 22-year-old that just joined the SOC should do about this. And if you can't answer that specific question for them, then some companies Companies don't even want to know what you found. Um, so that's another area. And then finally, uh, I'd say there's been an awful lot of attention in threat intel over the past couple years, um, and, and that's a category we think is really in need of, of focus from, a, again, an actionability perspective. Uh, threat intel, uh, for its own sake, is, is not useful um, and needs to be put in some sort of actionable context for, for people to get value out. So, so those are a few categories that I think we'd be we're very careful about how we would think about getting involved. There's always opportunity. Great, Amir. Is there anything else you'd add to that of areas to stay away from? Uh, I think you know uh, you and Jake are the experts. You see a lot more pitches than I do, so you can kind of spot the trends more easily. Uh, I, yeah, I would say that the kind of area that, that Jake's touched on, machine learning. You know, for sort of log analysis, I mean, very promising. There's obviously some some sort of, you know, value to be added there, but, you know, super crowded. And then how do you differentiate, right? I mean, is, is my data scientist better than your data scientist? Is my algorithm better than yours, right? How do you prove it, right? That, that, that's what's hard. Um, sandboxing, kind of an area made famous by FireEye. Um, the, the, you know, a few RSAs ago, maybe the sort of last RSA, there's, there's, you know, quite a few companies still trying to kind of show up there and say, you know, my sandbox is sort of better or cheaper or what have you. It seems like the big vendors have all kind of built their own. Uh, it seems like customers' ability to differentiate the efficacy of one sandbox versus another is is limited. Uh, so it, it feels a little bit hard to kind of differentiate in that particular area. Now, if someone built something amazing and it caught everything that everybody else is missing, perhaps there's opportunity. But you know, unless you have one of those, it's going to be tough. Yeah, and, and on the machine learning point, I mean, we you know, uh, machine learning uh, is an area of great strength in academia, and we've seen lots of machine learning and AI companies in lots of different sectors over the year. It does feel like this year in particular, the security, the entire security industry, rebranded itself as a machine learning industry, and, you know, you walk the floor at RSA, and every company claimed to have some kind of deep analytic technology to better spot anomalies than everybody else, and so it does feel like um, that particular notion is a crowded one. So um, uh, what, what are the other um, dynamics that happens within universities around software in general is um, open sourcing. And Jake, you've written a lot about open adoption software. And if anybody's interested in that topic, you should go read uh, Jake's blog on it. So what's your perspective on uh, open sourcing as it relates to security technology? Um, I, I think it's a I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, I, I think it's early days. Um, you know, I think there are uh, companies like Tenable that have been built on the back of open source projects like Nephis. Um, you know, from your early slide, the the core light guys. Uh, around Bro, and um, an interesting thing about uh, open adoption software, which is sort of how we describe open source, because open source to me no less describes uh, a business model than saying proprietary software describes a business model. It's not really descriptive, but, 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 but the beauty of open adoption software is the A, the, the adoption, right? That, that it helps you during this first phase of your company, the project phase, validate um, 
uh, the, the, the amount of people that experience this problem. And it changes your go-to-market cycle from one of let's knock on the, everyone's door and see who's interested to a conversation where you can say, hey, you're already using this. Do you want some more help? Do you want some value-added features on top? And particularly for academic and technolo technologically heavy companies, it's, it's a great way to sort of validate that real-world uh, viability earlier on. So I think we're going to see a lot of it. Um, I think there's also a great role for open source and open source standards to play in intercommunication, right? And so if I'm a large company and I want to um, share some, some, some intel, some threats, something, uh, but by what standard uh, do I do that? Or if I have, uh, if I'm building content, whether that's in my SIM or in my like security orchestration tool, how can I take that with me? How can I avoid this problem of, of lock-in? And so I think we're going to see a lot of different forms of, of open source and, and community building. Um, open source in many ways is, is maybe more similar to, to freemium than people would give credit. Um, and so just the uh, thinking from a go-to-market perspective, how are we going to get people to try? How are we going to get people to, to pick this up, perhaps in a time of need? Um, and if they get some value out of either that free tool or that open source bit of software, you have, um, you have an advocate. You have someone that cares about you before you try to go in to, to make a commercial sale. Um, the book has really yet to be written on, on publicly traded open source companies. We have this example of Red Hat, which was created by the financial institution in a, uh, the, the financial institutions in a weird way, as well as um, Hortonworks, which has much more a support and services model, um, which, which, which I don't fundamentally think is the right way to build uh, uh, security software. So, uh, you know, last comment I'll make on this point is there's really three stages of building an open source company. Project, uh, something open source. Product, how am I going to delineate what's free, what's not, what can I charge for, and doing that in a way that's in harmony with my ecosystem. And then profit, right? How do I grow a scalable business? Um, and, and, and so thinking in advance of that project versus product, what, do, what, can I, what can I afford to give away that's of value that the community will care about? Yet, what, do I, what am I thinking about now, right, that is going to be my, my potential lever for, for monetization down the road? That's an important uh, thing to think about early on. Great. And so we're, we're getting close to the end of time. And I think we'll um, end with one last question. Maybe, Amir, you could comment on this, which is um, kind of what the current kind of political environment means for security. So um, we all know what's happened around uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks, attacks regarding the election, and most recently the WikiLeaks release regarding the CIA. So what are you seeing in the market, Amir? Does that, does that impact buying behavior? Is there more interest in the market? And, and, and do you think any of kind of the things we're all reading about um, online affect the, sec you know, the security industry? So I, I think we're just seeing the sort of grave consequences of kind of how porous our cyber defense systems really are. So, I mean, I, I've been doing this for a while, right? It used to be that uh, a bad guy would deface your website and, and maybe put some sort of pornographic images there or, you know, kind of make things, make you look silly or something. Uh, and, and then it kind of like viruses would go on to wipe your hard disk or something like that, right? I mean, there, there was like some kind of, you know, um, I don't know, gamesmanship, if you will, associated with that. Um, and, and then it kind of went on to Intel, you know, kind of gathering information and maybe stealing some, some trade secrets and so on, which is sort of the more recent variety that's still going on. Uh, but now we're seeing it sort of trying to affect the fabric of our societies, you know, as, as we saw with the last election. You know, it was incredibly easy, actually, to sort of hack the, uh, the DNC and sort of get those emails out there and, I don't know, say what you will, right? Uh, it, it definitely sort of played out as a factor uh, in our election. It was in the news every day, and those emails were getting leaked, you know, right before election time. And from what I understand, it was a pretty simple phishing attack that asked people to reset their password, and it was a fake reset page, and about 30% of the people clicked the link and did it. And it just goes to show how easy it is to effectively um, 
steal information, uh, infect machines, and so forth. So, yeah, I think in general it's definitely kind of elevated the, the need for society to really think about this problem and kind of do things better. Um, I, I would say, unfortunately, there aren't, you know, a plethora of amazing solutions out there for this kind of stuff, which is why people keep getting hacked. And I think we're going to see more of it. You know, if it's worked well, we'll see it again. Now there's the French elections going on and, you know, uh, and then there's German elections after that. So I, I suspect we'll continue to kind of read about this stuff for a long time to come. Great. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're uh, out of time. So uh, uh, first, I want to thank Jake and Amir for being our panelists today. This has been a wonderful discussion um, with lots of great insight. Um, if, if there are any of the participants who have any additional questions or questions that weren't answered on this call, there were a few questions we did not have a chance to get to and a few that were kind of perhaps, you know, very specific that were difficult to get to. We're happy to try to answer them offline, so feel free to follow up with any of us offline. Um, and if anybody um, in particular has any follow-up questions or comments, they should go to Kirsten Lloyd. I believe all the participants have Kirsten's email. Similarly, we'd be happy to connect people to Jake and Amir if they're interested in speaking with them. Just go to Kirsten and we can facilitate that. Um, as, you, um, as you finish um, the webinar, a post a survey will appear requesting your feedback. It's really helpful for us to get your feedback to know what we can improve on for future webinars. So please go ahead and fill that out. So this concludes today's program. We really appreciate everybody's participation and thank you and have a great day.